Welcome to the CFB Paint Podcast. We're back again. We got Steve, Brian, and me, Corey. I'm hosting today. Today's rapid reaction. We're going to talk about who's to be the best coach. We've had a lot of coaching changes. We'll get to the coaching carousel in a second. But out of the three of us, who would be the best coach? Brian, give us give us your thoughts first off. Uh, so my immediate reaction is Steve. Uh, I, I haven't. None of us played high school ball even, uh, but Steve is very avid at the collegiate level in intramurals. Um, he, uh, I, I played twice on a team with him. It was once his quarterback, um, once a wide receiver, and he knows his stuff. He will scout out other teams. He's taken a class in college, uh, which thankfully the grad assistant who was teaching it actually like took it pretty seriously because it could have been a blow off class. Most for most people it was. Uh, but for an, an avid fan like Steve, got to know a little bit more. Um, I'd say I'm probably, I think I've got to be third here because I never played tackle football at any level. Corey did for a second uh, and would have received at least some coaching. For me, it was not until college that I knew that what, uh, you know, a, a one tech and a three tech was. So like it, it was a long time before I started to pay attention to some of the finer details um, of, of, I guess, scheme and things that you would need to teach. And, and still, like, I think I've just really out of my depth on a lot of it. Like, I can pick up on a couple of basic things, but for the most part, don't have the breadth of knowledge. I think I'd put myself in third, and my head Steve would be first. But uh, I don't know, yeah, Steve, I mean, what are I mean, your thoughts? There's not a ton of things I learned when they put you as a, you know, you're, you're in Pee Wee football, and they're like, you play cornerback. Make sure this receiver doesn't catch the ball. And that's all you really worry about. If the, <laughs> if the running back spills, you got to make sure you keep him inside and then close on it. Like, that's about all they teach you. It's kind of crazy, though, that, like, I played against players that – or with players that went to college. Like, our running back played cornerback for Michigan State. We played across from a guy who played uh, running back for Florida State. Um, so, yeah, there was some actual talent there. Um, not that I was accounted counted in that. But I don't – yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm a, a tactician by any means. I'll watch a few different guys from, from the NFL that kind of explain tactics and go through that stuff. But I don't think I would be able to pick apart a, a, a t- team and use the, my knowledge and skill to, to make a team better. Um, I might make it worse, to be honest. Let's be real. Um, but I, I think I, know, I agree with you. Steve uh, would be probably my – Yeah, t- I'd, I'd throw my hat in the ring there too. Um, just with – yeah, I've consumed a lot of football content. Obviously, that class was really helpful. Like I learned some of the ins and outs basically of – BYU's kind of base defenses at the time that was Bronco Mendenhall in their three four with the pattern matching zone typically on the on the back end and it was just yeah just fascinating to see how it worked and and learn a lot more about it and yeah like you said it was one of the graduate assistants we took it really seriously not only with like the X's and O's but then like coaching philosophy like we had to write papers on like what our coaching philosophy would be he had us read two different John Wooden books um he was he was into it, and you know he ended up being a NAIA head coach, and that didn't shake out super well for him. Now he's back at the the high school level, but he's a head football coach for a state championship winning team up in Ogden somewhere. I can't remember the name of the name name of the the high school, but like pretty successful coach, and you know, and it shows. I think though he's one of those believers in like what you do anything is how you do everything. So he, he took it as serious as everything else. And it had to have been the lowest thing on his priority list. But um, even since then, I've got, I don't, I don't have them where I can grab them, but I've got like offensive and defensive football strategy coach or uh, books from like the late nineties, early two thousands with just like all kinds of, it's mostly pro style stuff. I, I don't know how much of it is super relevant today, except it's just kind of, most of this, the strategy that you see today is built off of sort of similar philosophies, but with new age wrinkles to them, um, including something that didn't age well. Like one of the sections is written by Jerry Sandusky. But anyway, Just uh, yeah, I would say I'd probably what avoid the showers chapter. Yeah, yeah, yikes. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I would say I, I think from an X's and O's standpoint. The one thing I would really struggle with is just organization. I would need a killer, killer administrative assistant. Like, Are you not very organized? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying oh. that person, I'd be like, I need you to just detail out my schedule every single day. Here we go. It might even be like a two-person job where you know, I'm working with 
someone you know the beginning half of the day and someone else the the back half of the day and they're in they're in lockstep and they're keeping me on task keeping me organized because that'd be the one thing with all the things to do especially as a head coach a position coach is probably much yeah. easier but well all the best coaches and all the best people have personal assistants so yeah it's not yeah so let's go steve brian and then to me all right i I have a couple of things from this last week. Uh, the biggest thing was there was a big matchup in Happy Valley, Michigan versus Impotent State. And uh, they, yeah, what a disappointing effort from Penn State. I I don't know. I, I understand, like, James Franklin's, you know, he obviously fired Mike Yurchich, I think is how you say his name. Yurchich, uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, and, and, you know, it wasn't a great offensive effort, but I can't remember the last time we really had a great offensive output from Penn State in one of these games that really mattered. What is it, like so, 16 against Ohio State? Yeah, yeah. at some point, and, and it's funny, so on the CFB Paint Twitter account, I got into a little war of words with someone on, on this. I don't know if y'all noticed this, no. but some, some Penn State fan got mad because I commented on someone else's post about, like, I think it was because a lot of people were accusing uh, Josh Pate of carrying water for uh, uh, for James Franklin, and I I kind of tend to agree with him. I was like, no, like because he was saying like he's not underrated or overrated. He's properly rated because he's two and fifteen and against the spread, or, or he's like two and fifteen straight up uh, against. I think that's the number. I'm I, I'm, yeah. I'm maybe like one or two off there, but he he's. Two or in fifteen straight up against opponents that are in the top ten when he was not the favorite. So like he's he's yeah. won actually more than he was expected to. But to me, that's not the question. The, to me, the question is, can, what's the expectation at Penn State, and is he meeting that? Because they've yeah. won national championships in the past. They've won national. Right. Yeah. Like you should. The expectation is you should be challenging Michigan and Ohio State. And yes, you don't have the recruits there to do that. But whose fault is that? That's the head coach's fault. And I agree with you on this 100%. I was watching that Twitter back, back and forth. And yeah, up. well, the thing is, like, some Penn State guy was like, oh, I can't even remember what he said to us, but or said, you know, to our account. But I was just like, no, it's a legitimate question. Like, if you don't want to compete for a Big Ten championship, hey, he's your guy. Like, yeah, he's doing awesome and not doing that. Like, but for the one year in 2016. So I that's awesome. There, if that's your expectation, great. Less and still accomplish the same thing. But, you know, that, that's 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 another question. But even then, like if hey, if you're happy with that, that's fine. I, but I think that there are plenty of Penn State fans that remember the 80s when they won a couple of titles and and say, like, hey, that potential is here. Like we've been able to do that in the past. And, you know, even if it's not annually, like once every five years, I don't think it's unreasonable for Penn State to say, like, OK, every five years, we probably ought to assemble a roster that's ready to, to challenge for uh, at least not at least the big 10 championship, not maybe not everything. Yeah. Um, so that, that's my question is like, what, what's a realistic expectation for Penn state? Uh, I, I'd be interested to see, I think this offensive coordinator hire is going to be important for James Franklin for the long term at Penn state. Cause he's been there for a good long while. He's in there. What? Eight years. Uh, it's almost 10. I think. Is it almost 10? Okay. I, think uh, about right. I mean, he's done, he's done well. I don't, I'm not saying he has, he's done poorly, but it, if you want 10 wins to be your ceiling, hey, you don't have to make any changes. Him making this change, I think, says, like, okay, we're going to try and make a push for something above that. So I'll be interested to watch that coordinator hire. But I, I, I spent enough time on that. I will go ahead and defer to the next person in the rapid round. Sorry. All right, bro. All good. Uh, I think – What's really blown my mind this season is I don't think we've seen a playoff race quite like this one in the playoff era um, with so many teams chasing at what's going to be that, that fourth and perhaps third and fourth spot. Um, Oregon's still primed for, for a position for potentially that fourth spot. Texas is still in that situation. Alabama slash Georgia, like that, that if Alabama wins the SEC title game, then we've got some real questions, especially if they win close. Um, there's just a, a lot of scenarios here that you can see a lot of teams, not, not, not just one team on the outside with, you know, Nick Saban last year goes on his little media tour of why Alabama should be in pretty much everybody consensus. Like, you know, the consensus is like, no, probably not. Like, I think we got it right last year. Um, this year, I think it's going to be much more controversial. Um, 
and much more interesting because there are so many people still in it. That said, I'm really uh, grateful for the Pac-12 carrying uh, carrying all of college football this late in the season. Uh, this week wasn't super boring. Next week is Cupcake Week outside of the Pac-12. Um, you've got a good matchup in, in the Big 12 as well, but uh, largely this is you know the one before rivalry week where you beat up on someone small you get all your players healthy and then you try and win your rivalry game uh with the pac 12 and with the way things are going uh in the big 10 some really interesting interesting stuff to see unfold towards the end of the season I, i've just never been this gripped by the playoff race because it's always been like oh i think it's pretty cut and dry who i think is going to make it and then you'll have like one title game that will decide something like usc getting knocked out last year this year, it's going to be much more interesting. Um, there's going to be a lot there are of moving teams factors on the same day. Either undefeated or have one loss. That's insane. And yeah. like we expect, I think the expectation is that Washington will not be favored against Oregon. I think the expectation is that uh, you're going to have Ohio State and, or, and a Michi- or you'll have an Ohio State Michigan drop one. So then the expectation is Florida State will win out. But I mean, that's these are expectations, right? All these scenarios can change, and you could have people. Like Texas can win the Big Twelve, Florida State could lose up the ACC title game. Uh, like, there's a lot of things that could go wrong in there, and yeah, it could throw a huge wrench into what goes on here. And there'll be a fight over who gets the fourth and, and third spots potentially. So, yeah, so I, I'm just really? excited to see how that plays out down the stretch. Um, I had a friend who's a Washington fan. And he was like, "What what what needs to happen for Florida State to play Washington in the playoff?" And I'm like, "I mean, it's really really decently likely, but also." They could both miss it. Like <laughs> it's uh yeah. it's yeah. totally up in the air at this point. I it's it's a been a fun year. It's kind of crazy what it's coming down to is their pivotal games. Georgia, Alabama, Michigan, Ohio State, can Florida State win out, can Texas win out, can Washington win out, and really Washington, Oregon, and then even Oregon State. Oregon State's a two loss team and they play Washington and Oregon back to back in the next two weeks. Like they can control their fate on the Pac-12 championship, and they can. And then, their... yeah, would play one of those two once again. Yeah. Like, if if you ran the table, all three of those teams, uh, like all three games, can... that's a really. I know you lost resume. twice, but can we really say that you're that bad of a team? Like, I, mean, I don't know. So it's gonna be a crazy, crazy week, uh, crazy next few weeks. Um, this next week where everybody plays somewhat of their cupcakes. It seems like across the board, minus a few other games, it's not gonna be as crazy. But wait till you know the final week of the season and then eight and championship week. And it'll be get nuts. All right. We talked about who would be the best coach. Let's talk about the coaching carousel. There's been some coaching news this week. Um, Mississippi state loses to Texas A&M. I think the score is like 50. Oh, I got it down here. Let me see. It was 51 to 10 and both coaches get fired after the game. Um, Zach Arnett had, had been in Mississippi state um, for only 11 games, took over for, our, for a, uh, the pirate, um, Mike Leach, and went five and six in those eleven games. Jimbo Fisher has been at at A and M for six years. Went forty five and twenty five. He had more losses in those six years than he did in the eight years at Florida State. Um, it's a little bit harder conference, that's for sure. But all, at the same time, they they said they're stuck in neutral. And if you compare him to Kevin Sumlin, they're about the same. Andy Avalos, or Avalos, I don't know how you if you care how he actually say that last name uh, gets fired as Boise state's head coach. Um, he'd been, he's been a DC a few other places and, and had done really well as the, one of their assistants, um, but had gone 22 and 14 in his time at Boise state. And they had not been ranked since 2019, which is kind of the standard that they had had at least there. And then Brady Hoke announces that he's retiring as San Diego, San Diego state's coach. What are you guys thoughts on these? Brian? Interesting thought is the Jimbo Fisher one. I felt like it was waiting to happen. Uh, I, I was waiting for him to get the win against Ole Miss last week uh, or a couple weeks ago. I, I'm forgetting when exactly that was to save the job because um, that seemed to be the the recipe of like have a disappointing season, get a significant win that makes it look like hey maybe we're going somewhere, and then save the job and continue. Um, unable to get that done, I think that's what what does it in. It just takes a week of hey let's get our ducks in a row, let's figure out what our plan is going forward uh, in terms of the next coaching search because I don't think the Mississippi State game had any bearing on whether or not he was keeping his job at this stage. No, definitely I do didn't. find it interesting that none of the several former head coaches is the interim coach uh, in the meantime. Um, 
but this is easily the biggest one. Uh, and the reason it's so interesting is because last time they went and got a name from, you, you know, Jimbo Fisher is a national championship winning head coach. They went and got him from a premier program from Florida State. Um, they've got money to throw, and we'll see how much money's left after this buyout and everything, but the buyout's not all paid out at once. So there, there's uh, some flexibility that they have there in paying it out over the next, till, I think, 2031. Um, 20 million is paid out in the first 60 days, and 7 million it is due in with 100, within 120 days, and then 7 million per year until 2023, until 2031. There we go. So. There we go. And Thank there's you. no offset language, which is ridiculous. So if he goes and gets another job, he just gets paid more. Just just two salaries. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Hey, Merry Christmas to, to Jimbo Fisher, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I um, tweeted out this, from our account that he's living the dream right now. Like, oh, yeah. That's, that's all I've ever ahead, wanted, Brian. honestly. Um, <laughs> I This was the one that can shake up everything. Because if they're able to prize away a top coach um, from a top program, like a Dan Lanning from an Oregon or a Mike Norvell from a Florida State, um, those are coaches who I, in my head, I'm like, that doesn't make sense for them to leave. Like, just, you're doing phenomenal. Go back to your people, demand more money, get paid more, and stay there. I, I think they could both do that pretty successfully, um, unless something really ridiculous comes across the table that the school can't match. Um, if it ends up being somebody like Mike Elko, who is a really good coach, but at Duke, where it may not be uh, the highest of high, like, you know, ceiling programs that you could go to, then I could see like maybe this won't have as big impact across the board, but I mean it's it's a total like well they, there's a possibility they get just about anyone, um, and so it's just a matter of who do they want and who's willing to make a move at this stage because there are attractive candidates out there. Um, Zach Arnett's surprising to me um, because he's been there less than a year uh, or as, as the head coach, I should say. Very accomplished DC, and I think will be somebody who will not go long without a job. Uh, I think he'll find a landing spot pretty quick. Um, but interested to see what the expectation is for Mississippi State as a program. Uh, you know, kind of where they turn to from here. It was, I, I don't know. It, it, that one's a curious one. You know, I I, I can understand, you know, if, if you think things are going poorly, you want to cut it off quick. Um, but I haven't seen, you know, the tweets on what their hot board is and what exactly they're looking for. If they are looking for a, an up-and-comer um, or somebody from, from the G5 level or if they're trying to find somebody who has run a program at, at a high level. I, I just don't know what Mississippi State expects to be, in, especially in the new landscape of the SEC where you're adding Texas and Oklahoma. Yeah. We may look back on this one and be like, hey, this is kind of what we should anticipate. Um, but we'll see what, what becomes of that. Um, no real thoughts on Avalos and Brady Hoke. Um, Brady Hoke, quite a career. And uh, happy for him to you know, to see it out at this point. But uh, Yeah. Yeah, those are those are my thoughts at the moment. I don't have any instant uh, inclinations oh, or we'll get we'll get to that in a minute okay. you have, where you have to pick who's filling in a few okay. roles. But go ahead, Steve. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, the dominoes are finally starting to fall, um, and I, I don't think we're done. Um, I think there's a couple more that I, I think some conversations that need to be had about. You I, want I to make predictions, Steve? Um. I, I'm just saying. Do Do you think that Kirk Ferentz is going to be coaching next year? I'm not saying he's fired. I'm saying he might ride off into the sunset. Um, yeah. I so like I, I mean that's that's more what I'm driving at. Like I don't. I mean there probably is one or two others that'll be shown the door. I I wonder what's going to go on with Dino Babers. Like he won this last weekend, so another win puts him in a bowl game. So may maybe that's that's enough. But I feel like we've been having the same conversation about Dino Babers for about three and a half years now. So I, I don't know exactly what what the the solution is there. Maybe that's just what Syracuse is, and if they've come to terms with that, I, there's switching costs associated with firing a coach. So maybe keep him. If but, Harper wins the national title, does he ride off in the sunset and go to the NFL? Uh, yeah, I, I, I question how long he's there for. Um, I mean, people are crying like, yeah. <laughs> I, I love the joke that's kind of permeating Twitter and stuff. It's like it, they're acting like he's dead, and then it's like he, he's only suspended three games. Like, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I just I think there might be a, a few more. Um, those are the ones that I 
I, I have probably my eye on the most, and then obviously anyone that's, you know, anyone that's poached from an existing job, you know, obviously that'd be more vacancies, but, but I, I think there's probably one or two more people to, or one or two more jobs to open. Yeah. What, what I thought was kind of interesting is we saw a trend a few years ago or even a year ago where you fire coaches really, really early and try and get, get a replacement. Then those vacancies were not filled. And so now what we're seeing is a firing with two or three games left in hopes that they can fill the vacancies and still get together maybe a class ish before the, before the end of the, uh, the early signing period. Um, but like there seemed to be multiple people that were on it. It was like, come Sunday, we're firing our coach. Boom, boom, boom. And yeah, it felt like they all fell right at the same time. It was like, Oh, Oh, this is going to happen. This is happening. So. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, all right. Money where your mouth is. Who gets the A&M get job? Who gets it or who am I offering it to? If I'm the who AD? Do they go get. And who okay. They... So I'm, I'm trying to predict. Um, I'm going to let some, I need to stew on this for a minute. Bri, who, who do they go get? I think it's Mike Elko. Uh, he's coached at the school before. He's a DC who has done really well with, I don't want to say lesser talent, but lesser high school talent at Duke. Um, you know, developing the players into being a really good, solid defense there. He knows the landscape of the school. He's a familiar name, but also somebody who in a couple of years has looked just awesome in the ACC. I mean, Cutcliffe did excellent things with Duke, but kind of up and down, uh, as you'd expect, hard to sustain success there. Um, this last game, he plays North Carolina very close down to the last play without his quarterback. You know, like I, I think he, and I get that it was a high scoring game. He's a defensive guy, but I, I just think he's a guy who knows how to run a program. He's a guy who can put together a really nasty defense, which goes a long way in the SEC. And I don't think. I don't think your big targets will go. Um, to, to me, the biggest two names I see, or well, three names, because everybody throws in Urban Meyer just because. Um, I don't think he's coming back to, at least not to Texas A&M. Please give it to me. I would love that. Um, I think Norvell and Lanning are the two who uh, would be the bigger names, but they're doing really well where they're at in, in their respective schools, and those schools also have pockets that they can give uh, extensions and, and increase pay. Um, so I think it's more attractive to not start over <laughs> and to say, hey, I, I've put in some effort here. Why don't I just stick around and, and keep reaping from what I'm sowing here? Um, Especially if you so, have top so 10 my bet is Elko. classes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Steve, absolutely. what are your thoughts? I, I mean, I, I see that. I just, I wonder, I wonder if Elko has that kind of ambition. And what I mean by that is just like, you know, he, he worked at Wake Forest for a good long while. He, when taking a head coaching job, he took the Duke job. He could have stuck around at A and M, continued to be an excellent defense coordinator, and waited for a larger job to open up. I, you know, and that, that could be. You know, maybe I'm reading this incorrectly. Maybe it's like I see what's happening with Jimbo and see what's happening on the other side of the ball, and I need to strike while the iron's hot and get yeah. out now. So that could be it. It just doesn't like it doesn't strike me that he's got that kind of the ambitions to compete at that level. I just don't. I don't. I, I don't think so. And I, obviously, I don't know the guy. So I, that that's the one thing that gives me pause there. Like I think he'd be a slam dunk. Um, well, I say that. And I I think he would be able to stabilize the program, get it to a you know get it to a certain level, um, and. And then we'd have to kind of see where he goes from there. But he certainly would be one that would be able to kind of turn things around, at least in relatively short order, provided they're able to keep most of those players in, uh, on that roster. Especially the I think, talent, yeah. Yeah, the defensive guys, most of them, I think, signed up to play for him. So um, I think that that would be something that he, he'd probably be able to do, get them pulling in the same direction. So I, I can see him being the pick. I am going to go... <sighs> I'm going to predict, I mean, so here, here's kind of my criteria, right? They need a head coach, someone that's been a head coach before, I feel like, I mean, and I think someone that's maybe, um, you know, ha has some experience, at least to the coordinator level of, of being in that highly competitive, whether it's, you know, the upper echelon of the Big Ten SEC, like you know, someone that's that that's played for it all, or, or has has kind of seen what it what it takes to win at that level. Um, so, and Elko obviously checks both of those boxes. So maybe he's the guy. 
I think I, gosh, oof. Hmm. I wonder, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm struggling here, uh, as you can tell. Like, Dan Mullen might be the guy because he doesn't need to be the ace recruiter. I know that that's part that he doesn't like. Well, at A and M, you got a lot of money that could do a lot of the recruiting. They can do most of the the, the heavy lifting on the recruiting trail for you. Um, so I, I've seen him thrown around for like the Mississippi State job to like go back. I don't know if I don't know. Um, I I don't know. Like Dan Mullen might be. A, I I think your Elko picks. The more I'm talking about it, it's like maybe he's just the guy, but. To me, it's maybe not a splashy hire that A and M would want, uh, but they would sell it as like he's coming home, right? And like yeah. he was there two years, like I three think years. You, you nail it on the head. Is they want a splashy hire, but they're not going to be able to land one. Is what I don't think because you're looking at teams going to the Big Ten that can pay coaches now. The only people left are the ACC and the Big Twelve that don't get paid is that won't have as much you know in depth money to to pay their coaches. Um, I honestly. If I was Texas A&M, I want a splashy offensive hire because we've been watching these crazy, terrible offenses for, you know, six years now. Um, and I try and go get Kalen DeBoer. I know that he's got a four-star quarterback coming in um, as a backup, and he's not a, a Southeast guy. That's your; Those are your two issues. And then the other one is he's going to uh, Washington. I don't think you can get that. I think that's where you try and shoot your shot. I think you end up with Mike Elko, and that's the, the rest you can do. And Mike Elko will get you eight and four in in the in the big or in the in the SEC. He won't win win it for you, but he'll get you eight and four and maybe seven and five. I don't think there's an upgrade that's going on right here, and I don't know who would go in for that. The one thing that I found interesting is Norville didn't slam the door shut. So he didn't, and Dan Lanning did, no. and that's yep. the reason we're not talking about him. Otherwise, like before I read some of his quotes, I was I, that he was the guy I would say that is going there. I think Norvell didn't potentially because he can use it as leverage to make. Yeah, you know, I think money. any anyone who's wise and wants to get a fatter paycheck should not slam the door shut. Like that's what I. What about I mean, Lane Kiffin? That's what I would do if I were head coach. What about Lane Kiffin? I'll, I'll jump in on that one. So uh, the reason I say no to that is because he had the Auburn job last year. Like, you, you, is A and M that much better than Auburn? Like, I would say so. Yeah. You would? Why? Um, uh, uh, a and M's pockets are deeper than Auburn's. A and M right now has a better roster than Auburn. Auburn's roster was terrible last year, and it, it's okay because you freeze is fixed up a little bit. You at least inherit a pretty good offense. You're gonna have to go get a quarterback. Look who he's done with Jackson Dart. No offense, but Jackson Dart's not a great quarterback. You get an offensive mind, and you give him a few more dollars and a few more recruiting things. He's done a good job where he hasn't lost you games that he shouldn't be losing necessarily. Didn't look great against Georgia, but. I don't know. It's an idea. If, if he goes, I mean, he's got like to go quick, me. though. My, my thinking is because you have this window open for A and M players to jump in the portal. Like, yeah, those players might be there, but they might not all be there. So, like, the roster's better, but this is a you know, with the landscape shifting more and more, that's something yeah, that you stay intact. You have they to jump in the portal, quick. but that doesn't mean they have to leave yet either. So, all right. right, right well, right. there's some some thoughts for for you. Also noted that the Northwestern job is still open and Michigan State job is still open. Um, both have been. Can I just throw a, throw a candidate in for Northwestern? I should look at Sean Lewis. He's getting demoted over uh, over in Colorado. No longer calling the plays. You could have the most exciting offense outside of Ohio State in the Big Ten. He was coaching at Kent State. He's already familiar with the general region and the territory where you're recruiting at. Just do it at a higher level, and he's got a lot of film he can put on for offensive players to bring in now you've got some money to go to go splash uh get someone i think that might be right yeah might be a decent look. that might be an interesting one for a m as well um also there people talked about dion like you want to splash higher like it probably is not the best hire but it might be a, it's people splash higher it's, and you recruit the, like as crazy. Splash as it gets yep <laughs> yeah so i mean i don't think it's the right hire but i think you'd make some waves for sure and it suck as Dion would leave, leave his uh, sons and his other players, but that's the only reason I don't think Dion would do it. But other than that, because Dion seems like he wants, he's nipping it, 
at the bud trying to be the best he can be. But I I'm sorry, a couple things. Number one, Sean Lewis came up um with some other people on their shortlist for Mississippi State, which to me makes more sense. Um I think David Braun, the interim at Northwestern, is probably gonna get that job. I mean, so done so well. yeah, he's gonna lead them yeah. to a bowl game this year and and, and Pat Fitzgerald hadn't done that in the last couple of years. Are, are um, they five right now? Yeah. I, okay. So I, I say that. I say there's an there's a chance for him to do. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I think they are favored against Purdue, so that that they're expected to get win number six this year, according to Vegas. Close by go. very slim margin. Um. Th- yeah, Dion is not. <laughs> Let me put it this way. If the power brokers at A&M went and got Dion, I would say that they're not serious about football. And here's what I mean by that. Like, you got – he's right now – like, look at their recruiting. He, that's what he is. He's a recruiter, right? Look at their recruiting class right now. It ain't pretty because the results ain't been pretty. Um, it, it's one of those things where I, I think over time – again, he's ahead of schedule as far as, like, where he should be at Colorado. I think they're they're moving in the right direction. But I think to get those premier players, there's going to have to be some more substance, and I haven't seen a whole lot of that. And, and particularly with some of those, you talked about the demotion of Sean Lewis, kind of mid-season, mid-first season there. I, I don't know what kind of staff he'd be able to assemble. I don't know. There's a lot of things on that. I don't think he's a serious candidate. Like, yeah. you're going to hire, you're mad at Jimbo Fisher for going eight and four, and you're going to hire a four and <laughs> six coach as the solution like don't get me wrong like I, I agree like he can his trajectory is probably pointing up but i, I don't know I, I need to see year two at colorado i think that's where everyone's going to be like all right what does year two look like for for him before anyone really goes and and, and makes some phone calls uh to, to boulder all right we're gonna move on to our schedule our, our we're gonna go through the each conference and kind of talk about what what's going on in the conferences the games that happen this week and what we see at the championship, or what, what opportunities there are for the championship uh, game. So the ACC, we had Miami at Florida State, FSU wins 27-20. Virginia at LSU, or sorry, at Louisville. Louisville escapes for, escapes that game with a win, 31-24. Duke again, at UNC, UNC wins in double overtime, I think it is, 47-45. Uh, Vatek at BC, Vatek wins 48-22. George Tech at Clemson, Clemson wins 42-21. And we don't care about the rest. Um <laughs> <laughs> now the, sorry, NC State, the fact that Brendan Armstrong finally won a game for you guys, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, uh, um, thoughts on the ACC. We now know that it's Florida State versus Louisville or UNC in, in the championship game. That, that's the only people that have an opportunity. If Louisville loses this week to Miami and UNC wins out against Clemson and I can't remember the other team that they play off the top of my head, if they went out against NC the- State. They own the tiebreaker against Louisville. Um, so those are the two, three teams left in it. What are you guys' takeaways from this week within the ACC? Um, Florida State's a pretty banged up offense. They need to get it cleaned up before uh, – they need to get healthy before the ACC championship game. Um, I, I, they're the class of the conference, right? Like if they're healthy – I, I expect him to go into that game and probably be favored by nine points against either one of those two. I've seen numbers and, that say 11, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, all right, good. Um, yeah, then I'm just, when I say good, I mean, like, I'm on the right track. Like, others others tend to agree with that line of thinking. Um, yeah, I, I as, a, as an FSU fan, I want it to be Louisville. I, I, don't, wanna, I don't want to face Drake May in a one-off where – a sensational quarterback with one deadly, deadly wide receiver threat and a couple of other really talented ones that maybe maybe aren't quite killers like Tez Walker is, but like that that gives me a lot of concern. I feel like I'd much rather have Jack Plummer and he's got his own Jamar Thrash is a really, really good player too. I'm not trying to take anything away from that, but I'd much rather face Jack Plummer than uh, than Drake May for sure. Yeah, especially with Florida State's weakness being at the safety position. That's something you'd want to, I should say defensive weakness being at the safety position is something that you'd want to not have to to deal with. Uh, For me, the the big storyline of this week, because it's the one that plays in most to who's going to make it to the championship game, is 
Miami benches Tyler Van Dyke. They start Emory Williams. Emory Williams is not going to be available next game. He gets injured going for it on a – or stretching out for a third down conversion late in the Florida State Compound game. fracture. Yeah. yeah. Ouch. Van Dyke's back in. He throws an interception the way he has been the last several weeks. Um, so that that is to me like the, the situation of, okay, th- this is clearly – we know what quarterback we're dealing with. We know the struggles that he's had right now, but that's the only team that can stop Louisville from making it. Um, so that is that, that that's the storyline of this one for me. Um, and it's just a matter of can Louisville get the win over Miami? Is there any breathing room for UNC? Also, Clemson's kind of coming on at this point in the season, so it might be tough even if Louisville drops that game uh, for for UNC to make it in there. Um, they're not looking I think quite Clemson's as strong as they once seven did. In that game. Is that right? Seven. That, that's uh, not I, super gonna, surprising, honestly. Clemson, Clemson has started to play right. pretty right. decent ball. Um, but Yeah, Clemson yeah, favored by seven against North Carolina. So. Yeah, so, so to me, that's, that's the story. Is we know what Miami's got to work with to give UNC any, any hope. And then UNC having that Clemson game. Uh, it's just hard for me to see this any other way than being Florida State Louisville. But window's yep. still open. I'll give you my takeaways from this week. Uh, Clemson looked like their talented and swaggy self against Georgia Tech. They, there was one or two miscues, but like they played a different. They just looked different as players. They were just excited. They were enjoying the playing. They were dominating, and it was very impressive. A little too late. Uh, FSU beats Miami. Emory Williams didn't play great, but hit just a few balls to make that game interesting. Um, and then Duke UNC, man, I feel bad for Duke. Duke got hosed in that game Duke picks up picks off UNC with like at the five yard line they're up three Duke UNC is going in to score in the fourth quarter and Duke picks them off and the ACC refs blow it and give the ball to UNC and don't review it and UNC scores and takes the lead Duke goes back down and scores again but they you would have the ball up three instead of the ball down four um so I I feel bad for Duke in that game and I'd be really ticked off if I was Mike Elko but yeah, I see it, FSU Louisville coming in as well. So, anything else from the ACC? All right, Big Twelve. Currently, Texas Oklahoma State lead. Texas has a game on Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State has a game on OU and Kansas State. Um, those are the two teams looking in. What are you guys takeaways from a week on Big Twelve? Uh, I did Stephen for ACC first. Go, Brian. What are your takeaways? <laughs> well, me riding with the uh, the Cowboys. Uh, came to an abrupt, very abrupt halt uh, this last Saturday. Um, <laughs> I, I I think Corey was the one who called the upset. I don't know if he was predicting they'd lose by 42, um, but Oklahoma State, who's been looking really, really good, uh, looked very bad in Orlando. Um, this is one of the most exciting leagues to watch because I think any given game, you just kind of don't know what's going to go go down. Um, Texas game ends up being close in the score at the end, although there was never a chance for... Um, for TCU to go ahead and take the the lead at the end of the game, so you know it might be a three score win or only a three point win. Sure, Texas fans would have liked to win by more than that, but uh, in the end, decently comfortable. Oklahoma back on track, um, pretty dominant win against West Virginia. Um, is there more chaos? To, the hard part to, to for happen? them is they're still on the outsides because they they have they don't own the head to head with Oklahoma State. So if Oklahoma yeah, State say, really, they're screwed. We're, they're, so. we're just waiting on the Cowboys. Hey. Which team are you gonna be? Um, are you gonna be the team that that finishes this uh, the way you did in that strong stretch when you beat Kansas State? Um, you got you know all those 200 yard rushing games from Ollie Gordon, or are you gonna drop games like you did to UCF? Just look completely um, out of like out of your depth um, and, and open the door for Kansas State or for Oklahoma. Um, I don't know who wins the if if Oklahoma State drops, who's the first team in uh, outside of them? Is Texas' be, spot already secured? I think it is. Texas is, is Texas is almost secured. Um, I think if they lose two games, they're still out. They'd be they could okay. potentially lose, it, but they're almost secured. They're one spot in uh, over, or or they're one win over Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State though still has to lose. Would have to lose both of them to kind of get be out as well because Oklahoma State owns the tiebreaker against Oklahoma, and then Kansas is it Kansas State. They, own the tiebreaker they have a tiebreaker over Kansas State. They do not have a tiebreaker over Iowa State. Yeah, that's the one that would be potential. Okay, but so if maybe. they drop one, then and Iowa State goes unscathed, then Iowa State would take it. 
Iowa State controls their own destiny. That's right. Yeah. Okay. If they win out, they uh, they're in. Boy, would, would that be, be interesting. something? <laughs> I mean, they have a tough. Re- they have Texas and Kansas State are their last yes. two. So uh, they will have earned I won't it if they do. Th- this conference, yeah. I, I will, like teams, full teams will look like a totally different team from one week to the next. That that's the thing that blows mm-hmm. my mind watching some of these. We didn't tell our viewers the scores of the games, but Texas beat TCU 29-26. Oklahoma State lost to UCF 45-3 to in the rain with those beautiful space uniforms that they had there. Honestly, they missed a huge opportunity to make their helmets look like astronaut helmets, but whatever. Texas Tech <laughs> upsets Kansas 16-13. We, we did talk about, I, I mentioned like, oh, Kansas might be number three last week, and they probably lay an egg. And then West Virginia gets smacked by uh, OU 59-20. And for our viewers, the only other game that matters for them is Ohio, Iowa State, you know, lost or beat BYU 45 to 13 in a game that I, whoever I talked to that went to the BYU game was gone by the fourth quarter because it wasn't the part <laughs> worth being there. It <laughs> was brutal. I was, not at, I was not at the game, but the game was brutal. Yeah. Steve, yeah. what are your takeaways from Big 12 this play this week? Um, yeah, I, I, this is one where, like, I feel like we're watching the same movie every week with Texas where they're getting out to a lead and then finding fun and unique ways to squander it in the third quarter, in the first half of the fourth quarter, and then they either hang on for a win. In this case, I don't think they ever surrendered the lead against TCU, if memory serves me right. Um, but against Kansas State, they, you know, they're tied in that game against oh gosh i don't have their count or their schedule right in front of me um oh byu that was a runaway but like houston you know they're trailing to houston at one point after opening up a big lead it's been a a few times in a row where they've kind of just put it in cruise control a little too early and uh have found ways to win i don't know if you're going to be able to pull that off on the road at iowa state that's a pretty that's a pretty impressive team obviously that we watched you know we watched them uh, up close and personal this week as, as BYU fans in our house. Um, and but, you know, they've got some, got some, they got some players on that team that are pretty good, pretty talented. You're on the road. It's a later game. You know, it's a night game. I don't think if you screw around on this one, you're going to be able to, uh, you're going to be able to dig yourself out necessarily, particularly with one of your stabilizing figures in, in Brooks being out for the rest of the season. Yeah. Tory Seal, um, right. Yeah, towards ACL, which is really disappointing. He's been kind of their go-to, and particularly when it comes to when QBs have not been you know, firing on all cylinders. It's okay. The, the playbook then good. goes to, okay, hand the ball to Jonathan Brooks, let him do his thing. Yeah. Um, Cedric Sands was the backup. He's going to be phenomenal as well, too, so I'm, I, I have no worries for them. Yeah, I, he's good. He's good. I just I felt like Brooks is better and I, I feel like there is a, is a little bit of a drop off at least in terms of performance at this point right like cj baxter is totally talented he's going to be an awesome back yeah right now there is to me a visible difference between the two of them in terms of production so yeah my takeaway from big 12 this week or the same, kind of along the same lines as you guys like texas oklahoma state they should win out but who knows like you never know what's going <laughs> to happen this is the this and the Big 10 West are the fun conferences slash division. Um, speaking of the Big 10, we have Michigan and Ohio State. Those They're, they're going to come out of the East. doesn't matter if they win next week at all. Even if they win, even if both teams lose and both teams lose and they go into the, the big game with a loss each, they'll still represent the East. And then you have Iowa most likely, who's two games clear of, of five teams that are, are three and four in the Big Ten, which, and all those teams are, I think are five and five across their actual record, but I think they're three and four in the Big Ten, and then everybody else is, or then there's one only team that's like seven and two or something like that. I don't, I don't know, or five and two. Um, so it's most likely Iowa as long as they win one more game, you know. So the games that matter this week, Michigan State was at Ohio State. Ohio State blasted them thirty-eight to three. Um, Michigan went to Penn State, like Steve talked about, one twenty-four fifteen. Decided not to run the ball in, or pass the ball in the second half. I think they had 32 straight runs for for that game and dominated that one. And then Rutgers at, at Iowa. Iowa hits the under yet again with a 22 nothing victory. Um, Steve, your thoughts from the Big Ten? 
from the Big Ten, yeah, we kind of talked about what I thought from the uh, from the East. Um, really, the the big thing, you know, I feel like the East, well, kind of actually both divisions of the Big Ten, like we kind of saw both of these things coming heading into the season. This one's kind of played out kind of like we thought, where it's like, all right, is Penn State for real? I'm not sure. I'm I I, I was I, I think even when I drafted them, I was like. Look, I'm not buying it that they beat Ohio State or Michigan, but they'll give me 10 wins other than that. Uh, so that one, again, boils down to the game. So uh, it, it makes for a lot of drama, particularly with the uh, not just the, the rivalry, but but uh, the bad blood in terms of who's who's narking on who. <laughs> um, but like, I think on the other side, we we're just kind of like, look, anyone can win the Big Ten West, and and for a long stretch, that was actually true. And even now, like, it's not. I mean, it's a little far fetched. Iowa's likely. I think they're probably expected to win both of their last two games. But if they lose both of them, it's it's chaos. It's 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 everyone's in there. Like really, uh, I think Purdue has been statistically eliminated. But other than them, everyone else is. Uh, their hopes are still alive if Iowa stumbles multiple times in the next couple of weeks. I, so I feel like this one just kind of played out the way that we thought it would. I mean, maybe not the exact, you know, I, I think we thought, oh, Wisconsin has an opportunity to, to maybe seize control of the Big Ten West. And I still think long term, uh, obviously, there won't be the Big Ten West as we know it. And I don't know if they're going to like pods. It seems like they're just doing like they're doing yeah. away with divisions, right? Yeah, I think they've got, yeah, just maybe a couple of protected opponents for yeah. some schools, but not all of them. Um, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. I, I, it is one of those things where like, you know, the ACC coastal is now gone, which is always sad. Like I thought the coastal was always a fun race to follow because it was like for a while there was like literally every team won it and no one won it back to back. Or I think they went on a stretch where in six years or seven years, it was every team within the coastal won the division. So I'm a little sad that divisions are going away. Um, I, I understand kind of how it has to happen with the bloat that we're getting with these larger conferences. Like, But uh, I don't know if I have any other big major takeaways. More so it's like, all right, who's going to take the Michigan State job? <laughs> like, now, now, now that other dominoes are falling, like it, it's probably time for someone to start announcing some hirings rather than firings. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have to see. Brian, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'm curious to see, uh, this is like projecting to next season, but like, does Penn State go out and get a portal QB? Um, because I know Drew Aller was a big, big recruit and there's a lot of excitement that like, you know, maybe, maybe this is the guy with the arm talent to be a step up from Sean Clifford. I think it's gone the other direction. Uh, you know, I think Clifford looked much better against these top opponents in the last, not the last two games, but the two games that Penn State has had against Michigan and against Ohio State, it's looked like as soon as that first pass play comes up, you go, okay, we don't have to worry about the pass today. And, and I don't know. Um, I feel like they're not attacking vertically at all anyways. And so it's kind of affecting Drew Aller because everyone can sit on him a little bit. And it's I, almost like an OC problem too. I, I don't I don't think it is though. I, I think it's an out route that he'll, you know, throw off his back shoulder and try and protect himself because he's he's playing just a tad – I don't want to say scared because that's like offensive, you know, but he's, he's playing very wary of what the defense is up to, uh, particularly the D line. And, uh, you know, you want somebody with a little bit more abandon perhaps, or, uh, or, or bravery as needed when you, when you know it's happening. But um, I, I just think, so they need hey, Garrett green. I, I'm, I'm just saying, I think, it, you know, like less arm talent. Perhaps better results. Like I, I don't, I don't know that for sure. But like, I don't think you can expect to roll him out there next year and get different results than you're getting. I just don't think that's a real possibility. Like yeah, I feel like your defense is solid to put keep you in games, but your offense, offensive talent isn't risky taking enough, and like willing to go down vertically down the field enough to give yourself a chance to be in these games. Like you, you can handle all the. No offense to the Big Ten, but like the middling Big Ten that exists, because there's a lot of them. You can handle all of them, but you don't challenge. Like it's the gap between one and two, and four and five is huge, and you're three sitting in the middle of it. You know. Yeah, so. yeah. So uh, it, to me, it's a question of like, what what do you got to do to close that gap? And I think quarterback and talent on the outside is the places you got to look. Um, 
running back wise, I think we're all pretty big fans of their running backs. I, I don't yeah. think that's the issue. Um, and and O line's not even terrible. You know, they've got to get some really good defenses, but they also have perhaps the best tackle in the country. So, um, that that's what I look at with this. You know, it's all we're all waiting on that Michigan Ohio State game to resolve uh, who's going to come out of this conference as a whole. And, and the West has been fun football every week. Um. So you're grateful for that, but also it's like, I don't, I don't feel like there are real implications here. You know, you, you make it to a title game only to be the sacrificial lamb that goes and gets murdered by uh, the the champion of the East. So uh, it doesn't feel like there's actual stakes <laughs> when you watch it. And uh, I think, yeah, to, to me, the thing I, the two things that are there is who's going to take that Michigan State job because that one's not going to be Phil Bennett and coach, I don't think. And who is... What, what what is Penn State going to do to actually change things? I don't think a new OC is going to do anything if the personnel is the same. I I, I disagree. I think if, if Penn State brings an OC in, they, they might be able to move themselves in the right direction. I think James Franklin's a good recruiter. He just needs to get a little bit better talent even than he has right now. And that may mean a stronger investment from some boosters. Um, For me, same takeaways. The only other thing I'm throwing out is that Illinois Indiana game was a fun one to watch. I don't know if you guys saw that. Illinois quarterback throws for like 503 yards in that game. It's a 47 to 45 game. It's a, is that what it is? I can't remember. 40. Yeah. It's Illinois wins 48 to 45. And it's just kind of back and forth and back and forth. And I was like, this is enjoyable. I haven't seen a game like this in a while. Um, too bad. It was in my quad screen. It's quad screen. It wasn't my first, like the thing I was paying most attention to, but I felt like every time I looked down, the score was different. Like, yeah. <laughs> Moving on to the Pac-12, um, Washington leads Oregon by a game. Oregon leads Oregon State and Arizona by a game. But Air- Oregon State still owns their destiny and controls their destiny because they play Washington and Oregon back-to-back to end the year. That's an awful way to end your year, but also could be a major way to end the year. Um, for scores, Utah goes to Washington. They lose 35-28. USC goes to Oregon. They lose 36-27. Stanford goes to Oregon State. They lose 62-17. to Arizona goes to Colorado. They win 34-31 on a last-second field goal. And a game that doesn't matter, but we're Kenny Dillingham fans. ASU upsets UCLA 17-7, so we're okay with this. Um, Brian, your thoughts on Pac-12 ball? Pac-12 ball is awesome, um, and, and it's high stakes, and you just – there's enough, especially on the offensive talent for a lot of these teams, there's enough that there's a little bit of chaos. Um, kind of feels like old Big 12 where nobody could stop anyone, but everyone could score. Um, you have a few good defenses in there. Make no mistake. Oregon's got a solid defense. Utah, perhaps the best defense in the country. I'm not sure what they rate at, but it's got to be pretty high. And UCLA as well. Um, but then you have Caleb Williams. You have that Oregon juggernaut. You have Washington uh, who could score like crazy. We add to that a Colorado team that's very fun when they're rolling. Uh, Arizona with, I mean, you know, Fafita has just just launched that team into life. Uh, not to say that the coach and the rest of the team, they've got some really good talent on the outside. Um, but really awesome week. I, I was hoping to see the upset from the Utes. Um, and I thought maybe they get a chance when Washington goes to put it away with that interception to the end zone, except, oh, they drop it on the one. They pull the Utah move against Utah and then immediately get safety. Um, so that that you know you know shatters that dream real quick but a lot closer game than i expected to be honest um oregon has a they only have a nine point win against usc but it's a really comfortable nine point win against usc um they're looking just like the class of the conference right now even though they are um they are you know have that loss to washington they're on the outside looking in for the college football playoff oregon state's going to be the one that's going to be interesting to watch Uh, like you said they control their own destiny and th- this whole schedule for the Pac-12 has been backloaded for almost every team outside of that Oregon-Washington game. I-, I wonder if the Pac-12 just thinks they've done brilliantly with that, or if they think they're, you know, torpedoing some of their chances at, you know, them all cannibalizing one another. But uh, it's great for me as a viewer. I- I'm so excited to see how it plays out. Uh, for me, it's hard to see anyone beating Oregon in that in that championship game, or Oregon State getting the win over them. They they just look. Uh, they they look to me like a Michigan Georgia level team, uh, and I know they're on the outside looking in because of that one loss. But it, if they're in the playoff, watch out! I, I think they are going to make a lot of noise. Steve, go ahead. 
Yeah, what is in the water in the Pac-12 where players just throw the ball behind themselves before they go into the end zone? <laughs> Kaylin Clay does this for Utah. No, hold on. This is this is an epidemic. It's oh, a problem. It's like it's yes. Desh- so it starts with Deshaun Jackson, who plays at Cal. Now, admittedly, he did not do it at Cal. He did it in high school in the Under Armour All-American game where he tried to somersault into the end zone and left the ball on the one. And then with the Eagles, he threw it behind himself in the NFL before he scores as well. Kalen Clay does it. Now uh, Tuputala does it. What what's going on? Like I I feel like this is one of those things where like Vince Lombardi, you know, was famous so, like walking like his professional team around the field and be like, you know, he'd be like, you know, this is a football, this is a football yards. field. Here's <laughs> here's the dimensions. Yeah, exactly. He would do all that, and this is why. Like the game's about the ball. All right, the game is about the ball. Like I I just don't understand. And here's where I'm going to be an old man. You know, get off my lawn. But like like. Do you really like? Are you in that much of a hurry to to celebrate that you can't just like just keep it tucked for another two steps until you're like two or three steps into the end zone? It's it, it's one thing if like the ball comes out as you're like reaching for the goal line, right? If you're trying to make that play desperately, like obviously depending on the situation, I'd still say, eh, you know what? If it's on the one inch line, you can probably punch that in on the next play. Yeah, but I at least I get it, right? You know, like you're trying to score. All of these are like walk away touchdowns that there's just there's you know the play is not being contested. You beat yourself, and it's just it's mind blowing to me. And I I think part of it is just like I I, I like I hesitate to say, but I think it's it's just kind of this bravado. It's like it's cool to be like, oh, that ball ain't nothing to me, you know. They all get rid of it. So they're they're like so like you work so hard, particularly as a defensive player, to get the ball, and the second you have it, like your first inclination is just like, I get this out of here. Like the play is over. Like what? Like make the ball part of your celebration. You won't have this. I know. Well, like my thing is like, man, I'm not giving that ball back to the ball boy. When I'm on the sidelines, I'm keeping that one. Like I just made a huge play in a huge game. Hell no. Am I giving it away? I'm certainly not giving it to the other team because I didn't cross the goal line yet. Like I, I, that to me is just, and, and one of the things I, I thought was interesting, I, I've been listening to a lot of this where they're like, oh, well, they got the safety. Like, I think the next player, two plays later. And so, so it all worked out. I'm like, no, it didn't. They lost five points. Like, like that didn't work out. That game, they had to sweat it out a whole lot more. Like, <laughs> and they didn't um, cover because of that. Sorry? And they didn't cover because of that. Well, yeah. yeah there, well, there's, yeah, there, there's that angle of approach as well. But <laughs> just like, I, I don't know. Like, I think that would be something we talked about what we would do as a coach. Be like, if you ever do that, you are not playing another down for me. I don't care who you are. Like, yeah. I mean, at this point, I, like... I, and I think I'd have this, I'd have that, like, you know, heading into our first game, there's just one, one day where we practice for 10 minutes. Everyone has a breakaway touchdown. And what do you do with that touchdown? Go. Like, everyone's handed a ball, the entire team. I don't care who it is. My alignment are going to practice it too. Just in the event that they get a breakaway touchdown, we all know what to do, and it's just hold on to the ball till you're definitely in the end zone. Like this isn't difficult, but I would probably uh, make a point of it so that we don't have to deal with this. I was about to say, Kelly and DeBoer's got to be saying, if you have a ball and you're running into the end zone, once you pass the back line of the end zone, you can let go of the ball. Up till then, I need you to hang on to it. Like that, <laughs> yeah, that I it, think used to be the know. rule for. I can't remember what program it was, but yeah, you'd see guys run through the back. Like if they were, you know, uncontested, in, you'd see them run through the back of the end zone, and then they would stop or or hand it to the ref. They always hand it to the ref. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that too. Yeah. Um, my takeaways from this this week. Uh, again, fun matchups: Utah, Washington, USC, Oregon. Living up to the billing to some degree, um, but the next uh, the next coming weeks, I I'm really hoping we get Washington Oregon again, and I want to see that one. I'm I'm like going to be sitting on the edge of my seat. See, but do not count out Oregon State. I think Oregon State has the chops to beat one or both of these top two teams, and we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, fun fun conference to watch. All right, moving on. We're at close to the hour mark. We'll try and push this to be get kind of wrapped up. SEC, this championship has already been decided. It is Bama out of the West, Georgia out of the East. If you look on DraftKings, Georgia's favored by four points already. Um, that line may change eventually based off of the next 
few weeks. But Ole Miss goes to Georgia, gets spanked 52 to 17. Alabama goes to Kentucky and spanks them 49 21. Everything else is kind of a mute po- a moot point. But I don't know how you say that. But except for, you know, UF versus LSU, UF lets up 700 point, uh, yards in that game. And Jaden Daniels is the first player in FBS history to throw for under three, for 300 yards and run for 200 yards, or it might be even 350. I don't even know. That's mm-hmm. a nuts stat, and I'm glad it happened against the Gators, you know. Um, we see the Gators uh, recruits promptly turn against them in during that game. Um, I, don't, I don't know if anybody knows this. First quarter, you had a commit that was uh, to Florida, turned to Auburn, and then Sunday – you had a Florida. You had a commit, a cornerback who had been flirting with Florida State, but Florida State took another cornerback the day before, and so he commits to Texas the next day. <laughs> um, if you actually listen to on three, they like Florida State did a did a, you know, Texas a favor in the fact that they decided which cornerback they were going to take, and the other cornerback had to go find another spot. Um, but fun week. I'll give you my thoughts. Um, Bama and Georgia are real teams, and that is going to be a fun matchup to watch. I do not foresee slip ups in this game or in their in their final games. I think eventually Hugh Freeze and Auburn will give them uh, a hard time, and it'll be fun to watch that. But they've figured out how they want Milrow to work, and that is making Bama a fun team to watch. And who's to deny a one loss Bama if they beat Georgia? Can you say that they don't belong in there? But I mean, if you have a one loss Bama, you have a one loss Oregon out of there, and then you have a one loss Texas. Ohio State sitting on the outside that lost to a Michigan. Do we have some teams that have four state that are have won that don't get in or that have won every single game? I don't know. I, no. I so, but you'll have you'll have people complaining for it, but I, I don't think yeah, it actually happens. And if on a power ratings level, I could see the fact that you you would not favor Florida State against Bama or Texas or uh, Oregon potentially. I, like mm-hmm. that's I could see that foresee people com- making that conversation. So my takeaways are that, and also, I mean. Arkansas, what is going on? You win against UF and then you get spanked against Auburn. Come on, I like this is just I don't know what to think about this team. Steve, your thoughts on the SEC? Yeah, um, I, I guess yeah, our eyes kind of for me are also kind of pointing toward that that championship game. Uh, another showdown. They've what played three of the last four? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's three of the last four. LSU played them last year. Yeah, LSU played them last year. Um, I. You know, outside of that, there's some other interesting results. Like, don't look now, but Mizzou is doing things. Like, they've got. I think they they're probably at this point more likely to go ten and two than nine and three. They're eight and two already. Yeah. I don't see them losing both their last two games. They host Florida, and then they're on the road at Arkansas. They open up as an eleven point favorite at home versus Florida, which to me seems like a lot. <laughs> um, but. I mean, they, they're really good. They're recruiting at a different level now. Yeah, they're they starting – they're like, Missouri is – it's funny. Going into the SEC, when they when Missouri and Texas A&M joined, I think everyone thought A&M is the better program, kind of better suited to be successful here because Missouri didn't do a whole lot in the Big 12. Not to say that A&M really did either, but um, A&M has not won the division. Missouri has. Uh, Missouri's been to the SEC championship game. Yeah, 2013. Oh, okay. Uh, 2013, they they played Auburn. uh, They also were competing like the first year that they were in the the SEC. Yeah, yeah. And so they're, uh, I don't know. I I think NIL has been a really helpful thing for them now that that's a a legal thing. Look at what they're doing on the recruiting. Uh, You know, they're they're able to attract and, and keep talent close by. And that's they are good. in that's some tough battles. They lost, I think, Ryan Wingo to Texas. Yeah, the wide receiver to Texas. They're expected, but they weren't expected to be sit in these battles. You wouldn't expect them a year ago, and now they're they've won a few five star battles, and then are battling for second. And there's a beauty of a transfer portal that exists still. You know. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that one to me is, is pretty exciting to just kind of see what's happening. I, I can see a world where Auburn keeps that Iron Bowl close. Number one, they're at home. Number two, they have a pretty good defense. And so if you can keep Bama in the low 20s, you've got a chance, right? You're, you're going to need a, a pretty Herculean effort from both your special teams and your offense because I don't think they really match up very well there. But I, I, 
a defense can keep you in a game. And if you keep in a game long enough that, you know, there's, there's a little bit of doubt creeping in on, on the Bama side of things. I don't know. I just, I can see that game getting easy. Steve, if you were to, uh, I'm sure you can probably look it up. Are you going to ask me against, right. Um, I'm asking you. I would mean? say, yeah. <laughs> All right, you yeah, you look it up and you tell me where where how far off I am. I would say okay, so Auburn's at home, Bama ten and a half. Can you look. find that? It might be up to like thirteen, fourteen. Yeah, honestly. Okay, I'm seeing a. Let's look at some. I'll look at the Action Network. We'll see who that. Right now, they say okay. Bama 12 and a half. Okay. So, like, I, I'm in 14. the ballpark. Open at 14. I'm taking the over. And, like, I might take the double if, if that existed. Meaning, <laughs> like, you're laying the points with Bama? I'm saying Bama would beat them by 24. Okay. Wow. I I don't know. Auburn's defense is pretty good. Like, they've, they've had hiccups. You know, they've had some games where they gave up a boatload. Yeah. But... I, I feel like this is one that Q Freeze is gonna, you know, pull out all the stops. Like he okay. knows what it's like. He's beaten Bama multiple times. He's one of few people to beat Saban two years in a row. Um, I, I just I, I could see that game being close. Like I, I'm not saying I'm not calling for the upset. I just think some of the ingredients are there that you need to have an upset, which is a strong defense, being at home, a coach that's gonna, you know do whatever it takes and, and, and kind of really go deep into the bag of tricks to try and make it happen. I, I could see it. I could see it happening. You already got a, a preview of it with, with Georgia, right? They gave Georgia kind of some different looks, you know, something that they weren't ready for. I didn't have Peyton Thorne running for 60 yards on a play against Georgia on my bingo card. And so they'll probably have something, but maybe, maybe they've shown everything so far. So maybe, maybe the, there isn't, that's, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. You're right. It's, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think that's possible. But those, those are my, my biggest takeaways, and obviously the A&M job opening makes, uh, I think, everyone who's got a successful coach sweat a few bullets. I, I'm going to just circle back to this. Like, I mean, if I'm Norvell, I'm fielding that call, right? Like, did you see what Jimbo <laughs> just got? Like, I, I'm taking that call, and I don't blame him one bit. If he leaves, I, I wouldn't blame I'd be disappointed as a fan, but, man, you're going to put – like nine figures in front of me probably the and then fully Carolina guarantee it to, to a&m you know what's up we would be the south carolina is to us to a&m <laughs> yeah exactly just a feeder program oh okay. boy but i mean those, those are some of my thoughts on the sec sorry i took a little bit longer than you're good Bryant. what's up give me your thoughts uh, i don't know if i have anything additional to add honestly like M- missouri was going to be the big one for me like on top of the talent that they're accumulating, really well coached, um, executing at a high level uh, in these games. They've got Florida this next week. Florida is going to be fighting for bull eligibility in year two under Billy Napier. Um, they have to beat Missouri or Florida State. It's a tall task. Um, Georgia and Bama just look so good right now. The, the, they're, they're both just rolling right at the right time. They're peaking at the right moment. Um, yeah, I, I'm... I can't pick between those two. I, I'm excited for that SEC title game. Of course, we're you know uh, multiple weeks away still, um, but that's that's where we're headed. And then Jaden Daniels is he's a big game against A and M away from a Heisman. That's that's really what it is. You throw for 300, that's run for 100, you won your Heisman. Say, that, that's all it is. Yeah. Um, I, like, and, and it's kind of crazy. Like, that... That's not an uncommon occurrence for him. I think he can do that. Oh, I 100% agree with you, Brian. Oh, I'm sorry, I talked over you. Like no, totally you and I are on the same wavelength there. Like thinking Jaden Daniels is like, he might just take steal your Heisman, and I'd be happy to see the best player of, on a non-winning team, you know, win the Heisman. Like we haven't had that in a while. It's fun to watch electric players, and he's an electric player. It's fun to watch him and what he's done. So I, I yeah, that's my only other takeaway is, like Brian said, he's one game away from A and M winning that potentially. I mean, you got Penix. It'll be close. I, I wonder if this will be the closest Heisman race we've had in a long time, depending on how we're people saying. But yeah, how the next couple of weeks shake out. Again, he, he's not going to have the opportunity to impress voters, at least particularly later voters, in like a championship game, which exactly. Penix, Knicks, some uh, some of the others may have the opportunity to try and 
sort of steal it late, if you will. Yeah, J.J. McCarthy even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to do one more thing. The best of the rest. We talked to UConn goes to JMU. JMU beats them 44 to 6. They are undefeated this year. Tulsa at Tulane. Tulane wins 24 22. Last week I predicted that they would win by four. They Because they progressed one point each week, they <laughs> regressed and they only won by two this week. Um, <laughs> Old Dominion goes to Liberty. Liberty wins 38 10. And Air Force goes to Hawaii and gets beat by Hawaii 27 13. Um, any comments on the best of the rest, guys? Oh, I just uh, – the Air Force one is a surprising one. T Timmy Chang, I, I think we should now start introducing like a new little thing like do you know how to say football in Hawaiian? It's popeku. Um, so anytime <laughs> they win, I'm going to bring that up now. Um, oh, great. <laughs> so well, now we'll become little UH fans. Yeah. Uh, so every Honestly, time they win from here I like on out. Like, going in the right direction too. They're, they're yeah, looking. I mean how do – well, yeah. I don't know. Air Force has had a rough go of it the last couple of weeks. They've been really not a ton of close contests up to that point. They lose to Army um, in really shocking fashion where they just kind of give the ball away a few times in the Are early going. No reason that game or something like that? Uh, something like that. I know that they turned the ball over that directly led to basically all the 17 points that Army had in the first quarter. Yeah. And haven't been able to turn it around since. Um, still, Still time for them. I was kind of hoping we'd see a service academy in like a in like a New Year's Six, six game, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, that's a little bit disappointing. Hopefully now, now what we pray for is for James Madison to somehow be allowed in um, and, and and make that happen. That would be the, yeah, my that, next vote. Uh, that, that's what I'm waiting sorry, on is make sure enough teams don't get bull eligible because if enough don't make it to bull eligibility, then you start tipping below, and that's where they can actually make it in um and i wonder then with that like if you can now pop them up to the top and say you guys are now you know just outside the new year six or inside the new year six like that'd be wild to go from non bull to go to a big, big bowl. it would yeah, be awesome it should happen um i will say with with us becoming hawaii fans i have looked at them each of the past two years for the win totals draft um not because i thought they would win games but because they played they get 13 the regular season yeah. games last year and this year. So it gives you one more game. And I'm like, it's, if they can, you know, be average, then that one extra game could go a long way. It just has never, hasn't made sense yet. Oh, Brian's playing chess and we're all playing checkers here. Um, no, uh, it's something we've, I've considered too, making sure all my teams play enough games that I think I'm in the good <laughs> um, Yeah, JMU is just looking good and hopefully they continue to wrap to roll like this when they do become bowl eligible and able to win the conference too. Like that's what I just kind of hoping. All right. Anything else we want to talk about before we move into party shots? Anybody got party shots? I'll let you kick it off. Corey. Uh, I see you got some notes. Yeah. Yeah. I see yours. All right. So Jimbo <laughs> Fisher gets out. That's $77 million in his pocket. The previous record for buyouts was 21.45 million to Gus Malzahn. And teams last year, 15 schools paid 72 million for buyouts. Buyouts. That's insane. Like, it's a crazy thing that AM thinks this is the right decision and is willing to spend 76 million to get it done or 77 million to get it done. The thing I want to know is, is which goodwill do I need to go to in call station to find the plaque that has championship? Oh Oh, hang on. Because I want that. that yeah, that's creme to the creme opportunity to stick that on your wall. I might just make it up and say I have it, you know? That's the holy grail, Corey. Exactly. We, we should take a quest for it. <laughs> <laughs> Who's we'll the conversation tomorrow? <laughs> um, oh, man. Any other party shots? Not so much a party uh -huh. shot as uh, Oklahoma State, several weeks back when they got, I think, the win over Kansas State. There was a tweet that went out that was – I can't remember who it was, but they said this is going to be Oklahoma State's funniest 9-3 and three season ever. Um, <laughs> this is assuming – I'm assuming that tweet was assuming that they would lose to Oklahoma and then win out the rest of their games. They beat Oklahoma and they lose to UCF, and I go, yes, this is going to be the funniest 9-3. <laughs> nine... What on earth is going on here? With the early season, was it South Alabama loss where you just get Alabama. destroyed? Oh. And then you win final Bedlam. You beat 
Kansas State, who's a good team, you start playing some good football, and then it's just disappear when you go to Orlando and play one of the, you know, the bottom teams of the conference with UCF. I, I cannot figure out what's going on here, but Mike Gundy's keeping us on our toes, as he always has and as he always will. Um, I, I, he still got me for this season, because I thought there was no way he was going to save it, and he totally did, but my goodness, I... I have no idea what to expect next game, and you know it's just it's been a been a ride, and I'm I'm glad that he's brought me along with him. <laughs> My joke was going to be that the the whole team must have got a bunch of big league chew and then went on one of the rides at Disney World, just like the kids from the Sandlot, and they barfed all over themselves in that game. Uh... Uh, I'm going to shoot out a shot at Michigan. Um, I think they actually might be doing the right thing. Um, the amount of hysteria that's f- about free Harbaugh and crying about Harbaugh and special plays for Harbaugh. Well, UGA thought they were going to thought the media thought they were going to win seven games last year. Maybe this delusional <laughs> idea of being like not really in the real world leads to national championships. Let's see where Michigan goes. <laughs> I love you, Coach Harbaugh. Anyways, I can't. Anything I can't else? Understand it. Uh, did you guys see the handshake between uh, Mario Cristobal and Mike Norvell at the end of that game? No, I did not. It was uh, it. it uh, there was maybe not, a quarter I, of a second. I was gonna say maybe a quarter game. second. I don't even know if that was it. Like I, I don't. I don't even know if you had I think it was a syllables. shake. And I think, I think the eye contact lasted as long as the handshake. Like I think, barely looked at each other until they had to, and then they just boom, gone. No love lost between those Look, two. That they've they, been recruiting they hate each other against each other super aggressively the past couple of years. To be fair, Mike Norvell did go for it when they were up thirty-eight to three on fourth down uh, last year in the fourth quarter with his backup quarterback in. If I were Mario, I'd be upset too. But uh, yeah, there's there's no love between those two. Apparently, Mario uh, in his in uh, I think it was a little bit yesterday was like that was a safety, and people were like. Yeah, it was also an interception. It also wasn't a first down. It also... Uh... <laughs> they also had a missed hold call in the end, in the end zone. zone. Yep. That would have been a safety for them, too. Like, And, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if you guys saw TJ Pittinger's, like, screenshot. And I don't know the rule. I don't know how the rule's written. But, like, when the tackle starts, the ball is all the way out of the end zone. Now, that doesn't mean that he isn't running backwards. Yeah. But, um, so... I. You know, that one to me is, is an interesting one because it would have changed the game, but I don't know if it would change the game the way the Miami fans think. I think yeah. they're thinking, oh, we get that, we get the ball, we score, and then we get the ball at halftime, which, again, there is that possibility, but I don't see that offense driving 80 yards and get, you know, that, that field goal that they get as a result of the good field position from the no call on the safety is negated if you get the safety and then we kick it deep, right? So yeah. you're, you're not it's tied 10-10 at half, you're down 10-9. It is a punt. That's the one thing that they, they have to their uh, advantage. Like, it's not a a kickoff, it, you know, after the same. Yeah, but you're not but... getting it at the 31-yard line is my point. Yeah, you'll be getting Cause it. Because they got it at 31 and did nothing with it. Yeah, it's true. And kicked a field goal. So, um, yeah, there was some bad calls. Yeah, the, 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 mis, the mis-targeting, I, I don't yeah. understand. Like, if that's not targeting, what are we doing? Like ACC refs have been terrible. They've been horrific all over the place. And, and you know, that was a big missed call, but – to act like it's the only one is, to me, a little bit naive. Well, it wouldn't be uh, the first time he's a little bit, been a little bit naive. He sent out, you know, his his media to go push the narrative that Florida State will recruit over you. And he's like, but we can't, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, um, anybody see Brian Hartline's uh, liking the tweet? Yes. About- Let me bring that one up. Dude, Florida State Twitter is all over Brian Hartline right now because – They've given him a hard time thinking that he'll lose Jeremiah Smith. We'll see if that happens or not. But if you haven't seen that, go follow the drama on there. Florida State Twitter is a fun one to follow. Anyways, let's wrap it up, boys. That's been CFB Paint. It's been Steve, Brian, and me, Corey. Um, please like and follow us and subscribe and comment. We love to jab and talk and shoot, point point little you know, fingers at us and call us out where we're wrong. It's kind of fun. Anyways, thanks, you guys.